Hello, I am Patrice Banks. This afternoon, I have the opportunity to introduce District 66 World Champion, Elliot Eddy. He will be interviewed by Wade Randolph. Thank you, Patrice. Welcome all to a special interview with none other than Mr. Elliot Eddy, our champion. So, Elliot, just let me start with you because this is a deep interview and I've been waiting to do this interview for a while with you. So I want to get right off, what is it that brought you to Toastmasters? Wow. Well, it's, it's great being here. Uh, Toastmasters, it's kind of an interesting story. At first, I wasn't interested in Toastmasters. I didn't know anything about it. My wife started out in Toastmasters. She went to a, a corporate club at Me West Vaco. She came home for maybe about a year and a half and kept saying, oh baby, I, you love this. I, I'm in Toastmasters, you would love, you should join this, you should come in. So I did what all wonderful husbands do and I ignored her for a while. And then eventually, <laughs> eventually, <laughs> I was looking for something to put in my schedule that I thought was fun. I'm, I'm a bit of a nerd. And uh, so I did decide to go visit a Toastmasters meeting, met some wonderful people, uh, my mentor, Linda Kennedy, and I just fell in love with it and kept on going. Now that's interesting. Number one, let me just say, always listen to your wife. <laughs> I'm learning. <laughs> Number two, you say that you're a nerd, but it, you, I think nerd may not fit you because right now you are District 66 champion and we are pushing you to be the world champion. How is it that a nerd becomes a great speaker for the district? What's unique? How'd you do that? Well, thank you for that. I think uh, when I use the term nerd about myself, I usually use it in terms of uh, someone that's always seeking information, that's just going in and trying to learn as much as they can and trying to put that into practical and mm -hmm. uh, practical application. For myself, it was just an extension of something I've always wanted to do. I, I started out doing some acting. I like being in front of people. I like talking <laughs> and uh, one thing is I'm one of those people who think that if you have uh, have a forum you should have something to say mm -hmm. so I've developed those sort of things so when I moved into Toastmasters it automatically just worked out so well because they allowed me to at least explore some of the thoughts that I had uh, say some of the things that I wanted to say <laughs> out there whether you know whether it was accepted or not uh, and still go on with it so the nerd part really did help me because it, it was that underlying theme that helped me develop and find out what I wanted to do and really give me some ideas of what I do. So I'm just curious because you have excelled through the ranks here. What has been your greatest learning seen at the time that you've been in Toastmasters? Wow. Uh, my great, that's a great question. My greatest learning experience has really been about, it's really been a, a, a journey for truth. Uh, I've, Toastmasters has allowed me to go inside myself and see some of the things that are important to me, uh, begin to put together some of the ideas along with the words, of, you know, things that I thought were important all, all the time, and really discover some of the things that I didn't know that was inside there. Uh, and it's that journey, uh, meeting the people and, and having people that say, you know, well, I like what you have to say, go on and keep exploring it, that allowed me to just build my confidence to keep going, and uh, it's worked out for me pretty well. And I, I agree. So if we are talking about, and people are listening to us, that our new Toastmasters are just sitting on the edge of their seat to say, you know, I'm interested in this Toastmasters thing, but there's something to hold me back. What would you tell them? I would tell them to go out and experience life. You know, this, is, this really is life. We have so many facets of our life that we, that we sometimes acknowledge and sometimes we just put in a closet until later. Uh, this is one of those things where you can actually go in and not worry about failing, not worry about getting up there and making a fool of yourself, which I've done several <laughs> times, so trust me on this. But uh, it, it gives you an opportunity to go out there and, and sort of explore the world, explore the people around you, and really explore your own heart, explore what it is that uh, that makes you you what is it unique that you have to say and how can you say that to other people in in a conversational way if you look at your growth if you look at eddie elliott now versus where you were a year ago what has been your greatest learning what's been your greatest growth that you can articulate wow now i've always been a person that really uh went after things no matter how much you know how much someone else thought it wasn't a good idea but you know I've always been somebody to go after it this experience right here has allowed me to step that up you know mm -hmm. it's really allowed me to just look at a lot of facets of myself a lot of things about myself and just go and try new things just go out there and, and talk about something new go out there and learn go out there and research find some new information and find a way to take that information and, and put it in the layman's terms and share it with you know share it with the world or at least whoever's listening well, whoever listens. <laughs> you know, you say that, and I appreciate your honesty and candor, but you say that, 
But you craft presentations that are unique to the audience. You craft a presentation that the audience has captured because that's what brings you to be a champion. How is it, number one, first question, how do you find good speech topics? Because your topics are such unique. Yeah, it goes back to the truth. I had, um, I had a gentleman whose workshop I went to uh, one time, a great gentleman named uh, Mr. Randolph. And he, he, he kind of, he kind of, uh, it was very, uh, he opened my mind to a lot of things. And, and the main thing was truth. Main thing was what is it inside that is unique about me? What is it that I have to say? Uh, and then that, of course, sent me into a long time of just self-search, self-searching. And then what I found out is that all of the speeches that I craft are generally founded in truth, a truth about myself that I've learned. Uh, mm -hmm. Something that someone has brought up to me, something that I'm, that I'm in the process of learning and trying to figure out. It's always based on some type of experience, some type of, of real experience in the heart, or it could be in this life, but really in my heart, that, uh, that I want to explore and that, and that it allows. So I take those subjects and then I start to explore them. I start to figure out, well, what is it that's uh, so unique about this? And then I try to translate that. Well, does anyone else feel this way? Have other people felt this way? Uh, is this something that you know, people run into on a regular? And then I start developing from there. And then I just try to keep it as honest as possible. So are you saying that there is a level of honesty that you look for in your speeches? Oh, I have to. I have to. I'm one of, you know, I, as an artist, when I was growing up in theater, uh, I've always had this sort of strange idea that if you have if you have an opportunity to speak, number one, you have to say something. You have to say something that has some gravity to it. You, you mm -hmm. need to say something that's matter, that matters. Even when I was doing short films and, and doing acting on stage, I wanted to make sure that whatever it was that I was saying was honest and that it mattered. So I, I, kinda, I, I do the same thing in my speeches. Uh, I look at topics that, to me, matter things that are honest things. So you will hear me say a topic on, you know, follow your dreams. You'll hear me uh, develop a speech on, uh, on just doing the work. You'll hear me develop these different speeches because these are something that means something to me. They were either challenges that I'm learning to overcome, have overcome, or hope to overcome. And I delve in to try to figure out how can that happen. And then I just share my perspective with whoever's listening. <laughs> well, your perspective has brought you to a significant level, so I applaud you. You know, I, I guess what I'm always interested in is tell, talk to me about your delivery style cause, because your delivery style is different. It's not just standing there and speaking, but it's really bringing the audience in. Tell me about that. How did you mm -hmm. develop that? Wow, I like to have fun. I like to, I like to have fun. Part of that honesty is just, you know, if I, if I say something a certain way or if, if I'm disappointed, I want to express that. When I, when I was coming up in theater, one of the things that they told me was uh, the words mean, words are meaningless. Words mean nothing because the English, you know, really the English language is probably one of the worst ways to try to communicate because you have words that can mean so many different things. You have, uh, you, you're at a loss of words sometimes. So what I try to do is push past the word and get to the actual sentiment, the heart of the matter. And what I do with that is I use that, use my body. I use uh, my mannerisms, my thoughts, my eyes, you know, all of those things, I put those together so that even if you were sitting in the audience and you could not hear my voice, you could get a sense of what it is that I'm trying to relate to you just by the way I'm reacting to the stage and, you know, and to the audience. Because, you know, when you're doing this, it's two people. So you have yourself on stage, but you also have an audience and that's who you're speaking with. Mm -hmm. And I try to incorporate them by uh, doing the same things, you know, that they would expect. If I'm, if I'm hurt, then, you know, you'll see me limp across the stage. Because, you know, sense memory and people will relate to that. But then for some reason, it kind of endears you to the crowd because they understand. So are you saying that, are you more, when you present, are you more presenting from your standpoint or are you presenting from the audience standpoint to ensure that the audience is engaged with you? What's most important to you? Well, I, I, like to, I like to go toward the audience. See, I already have the idea of what I'm talking about and the experience that I have. But really what it's about is, is the audience, trying to make that connection with the audience, making sure that I'm with them and that they're with me, making sure they understand. So I want to do things, I want to say things that they can relate to. I want to say things that they understand. I want them, you know, I want to be on their side and I want them on our side so that we can all understand we're one, we can get past that, and then we can get into the heart of the matter, which is whatever that particular speech or workshop or uh, or anything or is about basically so yeah it's really with the audience in mind now i've seen you and what's very interesting is you have a unique way of crafting your humor i mean is that just something that you 
developed or is something you learned? Is that a, a skill that you've developed? Well, thank you for thinking I have humor. Well, I think uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> it can go either way sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, yeah, with, in regard, and that was, that was really uh, something that I had to deal with was the humor because, you know, naturally I like to tell stories. So I like to mm -hmm. go overboard. And part of that is just talking, you know, saying the things that are not said maybe verbally or, you know, internalizing some things and saying what you're thinking in your mind. Uh, so in the beginning, it was a little challenging to bring the humor in it because I wanted to tell jokes. I wanted to tell people jokes and make them laugh. And I had to learn that uh, there, for me, that wasn't as effective. For me, I had to uh, really go back to the situation and you know, find out what was so funny about that situation. You know, what are the different thought patterns that you could have? You know, if you see something happening, somebody trip on the street, you know, necessarily that's not funny. But I, I think that the reason some people laugh is because they realize that I remember when I did that and I tripped over. Mm -hmm. The only thing I felt a little bit further and they might bring a smile. So I, I try to find those common, common uh, threads mm -hmm. uh, between myself and the audience. So, so I don't tell jokes anymore. Uh, I really try to bring it out through stories. So that sounds like you've grown somewhat in, in developing that. Tell me. What was the greatest growth that you had to have in order to reach this level of competition? Wow, the greatest growth that I've had to have. Um, I think it was, well, the growth really came back to the honesty. Uh, because I, ha I have a tendency to embellish a little bit sometimes. No, don't. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> once or twice, once or twice. I, I've heard it. Uh, somebody gave me a call one day and they told me. But, you know, I, I had a tendency to embellish. So my greatest growth was really, you know, focusing in on a particular message, really focusing in on what it is that I have to say and really digging in and finding out what is the truth, what, is, what are the things inside that that connect with the audience, connect with someone else while I'm speaking with them. Uh, and those are the things that I, I pointed out. So my growth came about once I was able to figure that out. Then it was about building that out, and building that up, and not a, not really just throwing things in there, not really just trying to say things for the sake of saying them, mm -hmm. not throwing jokes in, but really try to stick with that and grow it. And it, it did work. It did help. Uh, now I think my speeches are a lot different than they were, let's say, three years ago. Uh, now it's not so much about getting up and speaking to an audience as much as it is about getting up and sharing, uh, sharing a story or sharing a moment in time with the people who I'm in the same room with or I'm, I'm talking with. You know, in your, as we're talking, there's something that comes to mind that you've said it uh, very often. You've said you're an artist. And that moves, obviously you've moved from just doing a presentation to being an artist. Why do you have that type of mindset? For moving from the presentation to, to yeah, you now you're saying you know it's an art to me. I hear that in your underlining tones. Mm -hmm. Why do you articulate that now it's an art to you? You're an artist in that. Well, because you know this is not something that's just innate to me. This mm -hmm. is something that you have to develop. You have to learn. You have to study. You have to grow. You have to go in. You have to get opinions. You, have, I mean, this is something that you have to actually work at. You know, t to me, art is something that is something that is about truth and it's about hard work. You know, you start off with the truth and then you put as much work into that as possible. So it is an art to me because, you know, it's, it's, it's not something that just came. You know, it's something that I had to learn and develop. Even though I may have had some talent, I may have had a little bit of presence, it's not something you can lean on. You have to develop it. So you have to be true to who you are and what it is that you have to say. And then you have to take that extra step and learn, you know, read, study. What would you tell the person? Because I, you know, I, I run into a lot of people that have been in Toastmasters for a while, and they say, "Well, I'm not really looking to put in the work." What would you tell that person as far as developing that work attitude? Okay. Well, it's it's important. It's very important. In anything in life, you have to put in the work. And just to stay at one level, you're not challenging yourself. And then to me, if you're not really challenging yourself, how do you better yourself? How mm. are you living? You know, life is about, you know, you, you go through a set of challenges or you go through a set of, of circumstances and you have to figure out, well, what have I learned and how can I use that to better myself? Not just so I don't have to repeat those things, but how can I use that so I can better myself, I can become a better person with a, a better perspective and then share that with someone else. And you cannot do that if you're not willing to work. You can't do that if you're not willing to put in the time. And the time for different people that, that involves different things. But I think number one, you have to uh, be truthful about where it is that you are and what it is that you want to achieve. 
Uh, first, you have to have something that you're working toward, something that you see in front of you that's a vision. And then once you have that, then you start to solidify the ways that you're going to go about doing that. And that's always going to be work. It doesn't matter what it is. When I played basketball, it took work for me, for me to make 33 pointers in 10 seconds. It took work. I know, I know you think I would be able to do that normally. Yes, and, and that's true, but it took work. You know, The first time I tried to slam dunk, I almost bust my head. But I went back and I did work. I worked on my jumping. I worked on my calisthenics. I worked hard. And then I was able to achieve something that I saw. And then once I did that, I felt good. And I said, OK, I want to achieve something else. Mm -hmm. It's back to work. So just to get an insight, where do you see yourself two years from now? Where will your work ethic take you? Wow. Uh, now, I do have a, a set vision of it, but then I also it's flexible as well. Uh, because it's based on what I know at this particular okay. moment. At this particular moment, what I see myself is, is speaking to audiences worldwide, assisting audiences worldwide, and just assisting people. Um, I don't want to really be separated from the people, the, you know, people that I live and that I work around and that I'm around. Uh, everybody's been through a certain number of challenges sure. in their life. And I think that a responsibility that we have on this earth is to share that with other people so that you can try to help them either avoid some of those mistakes or at least when they're in the midst of going through it they can look back and say okay okay now I understand what he said maybe at least this piece will work for me and even if that doesn't work let me develop something that will work so I want to show people that there are things that are possible that you can go after your dreams and reach a dream I didn't even know about a world champion of public speaking what four and a half years ago Wow. and then I found out about it and I you know I was audacious enough to say you know what I believe I can do that and then I started off doing the work. Got close one time and it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Next time I was as far away from close as you could be. <laughs> and then the next time I didn't even try. But you know, it's, it's, so it's, it's something that I've taken in little so that I set a dream and then I work toward it. I do the hard work working toward it. And that's what I want to share with people. Uh, beyond that, I think I leave a little bit of flexibility just so that uh, as things develop and as I find out more about this world and about this life, I can adjust it so that I can use whatever I have to the greatest benefit of not just myself, but all those that I'm around. It's very interesting what you say. Tell me about, this has been obviously a journey for you. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the people that have helped you along this journey. Wow. You know, um, in most journeys, you, most of these things you can't do by yourself. There have been some really special people that have that I've met uh, and, you know, more than you know, more so than others. I mean, like I said, I mentioned uh, one of my um, one of my mentors, Linda Kennedy, which I wouldn't even be in Toastmasters still if it wasn't for her. She she grabbed me by the ear. Oh, so she dragged. Wow. Man, drag is not the word. Oh. <laughs> She and yeah, it's, she's wonderful, and she was able to uh, she was able to reach me where I was, even when I was upset, mm -hmm. and bring me back in. You know, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't be here for that. You know, um, as in yourself. You know, just some. I remember the first time I went to my first conference, and you were speaking at that conference, and just that little hour, I learned so much that I said, you know what, I have to go to a workshop. I need more information. And then going to that workshop, it opened up, and I learned things that I could be thinking toward. And I said, well, why aren't I doing this? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I didn't even really have an idea that I could do some of these things until, until you said, you know what, you can do it. What, what, what is it that you're aiming for? You know, you can do it. What, tell me a little bit about it. And, you know, and then going through that process showed me that you know, there was something inside me that I could go for. Uh, people like, uh, there's a, a young lady named Rita Moore, who is one of my biggest competitors. And the beautiful thing is she pushes me because I'm competitive at uh, I'm a competitive guy at nature, but she pushes me, uh, and makes and that makes me better. And I hope that you know iron sharpens iron, so I hope that that goes both ways. But you can't really do this without uh, without having some sort of support structure. All the time, it's not a lot of people, but if you have a few people that are in your corner, uh, my wife, you know, even though I mentioned her last, my goodness, she is the big. She is my biggest uh, supporter. She is. <laughs> she is the person that will tell me honestly what she thinks and what I'm doing and if I'm on point or not. And I appreciate that. I can't really go. I mean, she must have heard maybe about five thousand speech titles and two thousand speech. But I can't. You know. So you have to have that support structure sure. along the way. And I've been fortunate to have some very, very supportive people in my life. You know. And, and first, I must say, it's always important to have someone in your corner such as your other half you can't do this alone but there is uh 
Tell me about the times, if I can put you on the spot for a moment. Tell me about the times because life's like a roller coaster. You know, sometimes it's challenging. How is it that you keep yourself going in those challenging times? <laughs> I'm a quite stubborn person. <laughs> yeah, I know that doesn't come across. You know, uh, no, but, uh, surprise. But yeah. <laughs> You know, it's a it's a combination of things. You know, because I I talk well, I speak well, and I I, I say the things that I that are on my heart, and I go after those things. Um, but then there are times where I'm just so far down that I can't I can't see the light of day. I just I don't think I can do it. And that's really the times that you know my wife comes in, and you know just a word. Uh, sometimes she'll listen to me. Sometimes she'll act like she's listening to me. <laughs> uh, but you know she's always she's always there, and, and when I'm down, she'll remind me of some of the things that I've said when I was up. She'll remind me that darkness doesn't last always. She'll remind me that disappointment may happen, but you can't come through that disappointment as long as you focus on what your original goal was. Uh, so fortunately now, uh, since we've been married for almost 20 years now, and um, throughout that 20 years, she's you know, not only she's been my biggest cheerleader, but she's really, uh, she's really helped bring me up every time I was down. And, and there's been quite a few times. Hmm. Good wife. Yeah. We wouldn't make it without. Yeah. Well, we've got a week before you really enter this competition. Tell me, what is it that you're going to do unique? And I don't want to reveal the whole thing, but what is it that we can expect from you at this competition? Wow, this is, I'm going all out. This will be the, uh, the biggest, biggest stage that I've been on so far and this will be the biggest uh, opportunity so I'm going to give it 110 percent the thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to build on the stuff that I start out with okay. you know I'm going to you know going for good content it's, I'm going to give great content because it's going to be true it's going to be true not just to me but true to life life experiences for example uh, one of the speeches is going to be just do the work which has allowed me to overcome a lot of the obstacles that I faced and to learn how to continue on and how to continue to dream and make those dreams come true. Uh, and I'm, of course, I'm going to put my theatrical background oh, in effect. Oh my goodness, I'm about, oh my goodness, I'm about to put it on. But uh, I think the combinations of what I do well, uh, which is, you know, my writing and getting, you know, something consistent that's true to my, to my heart and true to the people that'll be in the audience. And then add that, add with that, the, uh, my acting training or my, my staging, uh, I'm, I have a few moves that's going to be awesome, you know, I, you know, and of course I threw a couple of things in there that nobody's ever thought of doing, so it's going to be a first in Toastmasters history. First! Excellent. So as we close this interview, and I so much appreciate your insight, your mindfulness, as I ask all my guests, just imagine 20 years from now, as you're looking back on this moment, what would you like for the listening audience and the audience here to, to remember about Eddie Elliott? 20 years from now, I think what would be, what would really be something is if, some, if I were able to meet someone and they would say, I remember you. I remember that you were up there and you told and you said that the most important things are to be truthful to yourself and to always do the work and continue because you can do it. I think that's, that's really the lesson to be learned because nobody starts out at the top. You know, we have to start somewhere. And I, I hope that that's what they'll see. They'll see somebody who put in the work, uh, loved what they did, and was as truthful as possible. Well, we, we can tell that you love what you do. So in closing and thanking you for being here, thank you for our yeah. guests, we only look forward to next week and that you give them 100 and 10%. Thank you. Thank you. Tear down this wall. Because when it comes to a disease, freedom requires leadership, and leadership requires oratory. You have to speak to be heard. I have a dream. It's all about personal growth and guts. Never give in. Never, never, never. Good afternoon, and welcome to our table topics portion of this session. I'd like a volunteer to come up 
and participate in our table topics today. Thank you for coming up. How are you? Your I'm name, please. My name is Lawrence Roberts. Good afternoon, Lawrence. Lawrence, can you tell us, in your own words, in your opinion, what do you think it takes to be a world champion? In my own words, what does it take to be a world champion? First off, world champion, that's encompassing so much. And when I say, I mean, think about it. You're not just a city champion. You're not just a county, country. You're the world. So before you even get there, you have to see the vision. You have to believe that you can do it, and you have to put the work in. Putting the work in, what does that really mean? One, you have to practice your craft, whatever it is. I'm gonna use Michael Jordan for an example. Michael Jordan was known all throughout the world. I was in Korea in 1995, and the little Koreans, they all knew him. Michael Jordan, you Michael Jordan? <laughs> and they knew him. Why? He put the work in. When you put work in like that, it shows through. Not only that, he believed, he believed that he was the best. No one told him, hey, you're not the best. Oh, they, they probably did, but he believed he can do it. And so essentially, you got to put the work in to be a world champion. Thank you, Lauren. <laughs> At this time, we'll have another participant, volunteer, to be a participant for our table topics. Our theme today is World Championship. Any volunteers? Any volunteers? Thank you. Come on up. Hi, Hi how are you? Please tell us your name. Hi, my name is Teresa Abraham. And first of all, it's an honor to be here today and to be allowed the opportunity to speak. When it comes to being a champion, I'll give you a little bit of my background. I'm getting ready to retire after 24 years active duty military. And I'm conducting my internship for uh, my PhD in clinical psychology at the Neuropsychological Services of Virginia. So when it comes to being a champion, I think it's someone that does not settle for mediocrity. Yes. Someone that continues to strive and drive for excellence. Absolutely. Regardless of what they've been told, uh, what, when they've been told they can't accomplish their dreams, just continue to work for your dreams. That's my definition of, of um, being a champion. Thank you, thank you. Have a great day. At this time, this concludes our session for Table Topics. We'll see you at our next meeting. Thank you.